Fix it with Mike. Plugin rant of the week. Why plugin emulations will never, in capital letters, be exactly like the real thing. Uh, this is something that is an extension. And the reason why I've done this, you know, because there's no plugin here for the plugin of the week. That's why I put the rant. But it's sort of an extension of a lot of the comments that I get about analog emulations that I've done on the website. And so I love doing uh, vintage emulations, and there are lots of companies who make really great ones, uh, particularly Universal Audio. You see me do a lot of reviews because they make a lot of great stuff. And uh, I love reviewing these things because I love talking about the history, where these things were used, how they're used, and how to use them today, right? But one of the, a, a comment that I get very often with a lot of these plugins no matter how well emulated it is, you find somebody inevitably who has the real thing, or at least claims that they do, and they'll tell you that it's not the same, you know, like that the real thing is so much better and that the emulation is nothing like it. So uh, the SPL Iron plugin is a particular one that's like that, you know, and I think it's a good emulation. I've never worked with the hardware, so it's hard for me to say, oh, does this, you know, sound exactly or act exactly like the real thing? Um, you know, so there, there's some some balance in with that sort of thing, but it's, you know, also $300 versus $6,000. So whatever the hardware unit is. So there's a difference there and they're two different worlds, right? And this is sort of the whole idea. And, and what I often comment about um, when I do these things, it's like, yeah, it's, you're operating in a different world and the analog world and the best analogy that I think I've been able to come up with is imagine that you've purchased an off-road vehicle, four-wheel drive vehicle, right? That's designed for going off-road. So uh, you take it down like all of these dirt pathways and dirt roads. And, and so as you're driving through, you got all these big holes in the ground. You're driving over tree roots and big rocks and stuff like that. And so there's a fun part of that, right? You've got this vehicle that's designed to handle a suspension system. It's designed to handle all this stuff. And you really have to pay close attention to everything, especially if you're driving, you know, at a, at a pace, you know, at some kind of a rapid pace, so you don't flip the vehicle over, but it's fun, right? And you really, you know, all these bumps in the road, everything is really exciting. If you take that same vehicle and you put it out on the highway and where the road is straight, the highway is like perfectly low potholes, no nothing. You're just sort of driving on this perfectly level road. The experience is very different, even though it's the exact same vehicle. Okay. And this is the best comparison I can have for the analog world versus the digital world. All right. Because when you're on that highway, it's like, you know, you get in that your same vehicle, you're driving on the highway. It's like, man, same steering wheel. Seats are exactly the same. Gas pedal is exactly the same. Same color of the car on the outside. And that's sort of like the plug-in version of what you have. And that's what the difference in the experience was. So let me explain a little bit more about why I say that and what I mean by that. When you work in the analog world, there's loads and loads of inefficiencies that you're constantly trying to dodge working in the analog world. So if I go back to the days where I started in the early mid-80s, in that era and started working, um, all of the recordings at that point, or practically all of them, were done analog tape, um, analog multi-track tape, everything from 16-track. Most of this stuff was 24, 48-track uh, by mid-'80s, and, um, and through analog consoles, right? All the gear was analog. And so what were all the problems that you dealt with? Well, you have, you know, microphones, that, you know, are in, you know, especially vintage ones that are in varying uh, quality or uh, uh, condition, you know, in maintenance. You got all these connectors that go from the microphone, you know, the, the mic cables, the quality of the mic cables. So you got connectors there. You plug it into a wall. That cable goes down into the floor uh, and, you know, maybe going through 100 feet of cable or so comes up on a multi-pin connector to plug underneath a patch bay. So it shows up on a patch point, goes through another multi-pin cable to get into the actual console where the amplifier exists. So if you wanted to patch in some external processor, you're using patch cables and you got the quality quality of the patch cables, the, the, um, you know, the quality of the patch points. So you're going through like all kinds of connection points, uh, cables, and then this is not even including impedance mismatches. So where you plug in a microphone into a preamp and the impedance um, doesn't quite match up, even if it's close or relatively, it changes the quality and the sound, right, of the microphone. 
And this works with everything. So as you, even as you plug like one particular piece of vintage gear into another piece of gear, into a modern piece of gear, all on the insert through patch points and everything going through the console, you go through hundreds of feet of cable, right? The signal gets degraded. There's resistance built into all the cable. There's degradation in all the connection points, right? You record that signal. You go through all of these, you know, preamps, maybe you compress it, maybe you equalize it, you record it onto tape. And what happens on the tape? Well, when you get on playback, you got tape hiss, right? You have tape compression, you have crosstalk between channels, right? So this is not even including, so you have all of this, and even when you record the tape, what ends up happening is, you know, it sounds right, beautiful and crystal clear for about a week. And then six months later, when you go to mix it, a lot of the high frequency energy is lost. It degrades over time. If you're running the tape, uh, on the machine, there's actual physical wear from it rubbing across the heads and through all the mechanical mechanisms of it, and, and the magnetic fields sort of average each other out a little bit. So it's not quite as crisp and as clear. So by the time you end up getting to the mix down, you're adding loads of more high end into things than you probably would if you tracked it like right in the beginning, or if you tracked it to digital where all the high frequencies were preserved perfectly. So over time, there was like all of these sort of things that would get in the way. This doesn't even get into all, getting into all of the stuff and the inefficiencies within the gear itself. So you're constantly dodging, uh, I don't know, things, you know, like hums and buzzes and RF and, you know, a tube that all of a sudden decides that it, it's going to start ringing or whining. Uh, the biasing of the tubes being calibrated right, all the parts, you know, like you have dried out capacitors and other, you know, older components that aren't acting as efficiently. And then when you actually get to the individual components, like say you have an 1176 or a pair of them in a rack, they never actually work perfectly the same, right? Those numbers don't exactly line up in the thresholds and when you're setting like the recovery and the VO meters aren't maybe calibrated exactly the same. There are no two that are the same, right? They're all different from each other. The accumulation of all those variances, and then you get into the console itself and all the variances that happen from channel strip to channel strip. It reminds me of this one tracking session that I did. I was in a tracking session. It was in New York City, and it was at this studio, really nice room. It had these two Neve, uh, I want to say there were, I, I can't remember exactly. I think there were 8028 consoles, you know, or maybe there were 8048 consoles or something. But they took these two consoles and they um, put them together, right? So where, you know, the console sizes back then uh, would have been, you know, uh, like 32 channel, I think. Right, so they would put two of those together and share the same center section. So the two separate consoles, you'd have the 64 channel desk. So it was one of those type of situations. And I'm working my way through like the whole left side of the desk with preamps, like nothing is sounding right. Right, and I'm going through and I'm adding microphones, going through the session. It's like you know this doesn't feel right. I get onto the other side of the console where I, I finally get through enough microphones. We have to plug something on the other side of the console. I push up the microphone. It's like oh my god, this sounds amazing. It's like, let me move something else over here. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I realized like the whole right-hand side of the desk sounded a thousand times better than the left-hand side of the desk. What caused that? I have no freaking idea. No two of the consoles ever sounded the same. No two channel strips sounded exactly the same. Nothing. So what do you end up in? So these are all the bumps in the road. These are all the routes that you're kind of riding over, the rocks in the road, you know, the you know big divots in the dirt road that you're going through that makes the four-wheel drive thing so exciting. And all the gear that's sort of embedded and enmeshed in all of that is bringing in all these characteristics that you're sort of fighting and working your way through, right? When you get into the digital realm, though, this is the highway. Everything is perfect. Everything is linear. No curves in the road, no divots in the road. Everything, the line is perfectly straight. You know, there are little reflector things down the middle so that you don't, you know, like lose your way on the road or little, those little things that keep you from, you know, um, you know, uh, going off the road. It sort of makes your car vibrate or whatever. Um, so when you go into the digital realm, all of a sudden you're taking these analog emulations and you're putting them in this a system in this place where everything is much more generic. And then you're saying, well, why am I not getting the character and the excitement and the whole thing that I'm getting from the analog world? Because you've extracted something from that environment, put it in some place that's completely foreign. So it looks the same, right? You sit down and you adjust the knobs. It does all of the same things, but it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't have the same character. It doesn't have, doesn't just seem to have the same visceral 
um, kind of quality that you get from the real thing. And that has been my experience all along. So what does this mean in the long term? Because when you look at the overall point of this, what you're getting at is something where, you know, obviously plug-in manufacturers are going to market and they're going to sell you things is like some perfect emulation. And I think what would happen is if you just sort of took an idealized, you know, like a perfect 1176 and they go through the whole process of doing the emulation and all the characteristics and the nonlinearities. And then what they do is they, they set up the real thing and they plug it through an insert. So through some, through some super high end A to D converter, they run it through the 1176 and they give you the ability to compare the plugin up against that thing in total isolation, only basically through two total feet of, uh, and, and, you know, a couple of connection points, you know, between the A to D converters and D to A converters running in through this device and you do an A-B comparison. I bet most people would actually be fooled. I bet most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference or that the difference would be so negligible you'd think it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But in the greater context of everything else, when you start to put it in and, you know, you, you know, in all the studios that I worked in, you didn't have an 1176 for every channel. You maybe had two of them interact. So you're deciding, oh, do I want to use these on the guitars? What are the, what's the most important? Do I want to use them on the vocals? What's Where are these going to be most helpful to me? And they're used nowhere else in the mix and no two are identical, right? So when you get to your mix, if you use that same, say, you know, say you want to mix like you're on it. Uh, an old Neve console. So you used a 1073 channel strip, right? And you go through and you put that across all of your channels and you're mixing. Those are all identical emulations of each other, but the real thing is not that way. So companies that do cool things, you see me like do a lot of stuff with Brainworks and their BX consoles, they have that tolerance modeling technology. So they realize like, hey, they're all a little bit different. And to me, that's like an amazing thing. It really adds a lot of depth and character. And it's probably 10% of what you get in the real world because they're keeping things within a real, you know, modeled, you know, like more of like a, a, a perfect, you know, this is what you would want it to be, efficiency. <laughs> you know, in terms of the analog manufacturer as opposed to the reality of a lot of studios in a lot of situations. And so the fact that those types of things happen um, are very important to kind of understand. So you can start to bring some of this because when you start to bring these, these components into your digital sessions, it's not that they're useless because they're not exactly the same. And it's not that they operate any differently. But the totality of the experience extracted from the analog world is not going to be exactly the same. So there are many things like one of my like a favorite compressor mount is the V-Comp, right? The, by way of it. just love that compressor. It's such a useful compressor. Does it sound exactly like a Neve 2254? You know, the original one from 1969? I don't know. You know, I don't have I've used those. I don't have that solid of a memory, but it's an incredibly useful plugin for warming up a sound in a digital mix. And I use it that way a lot. And a lot of these other things, a lot of these other elements and things like Fairchilds and stuff, I use in ways that I would never dare to use in the analog world, like really overdriving them and super compressing. I would never do that because if you blew up a Fairchild, it was like there's only 75 of them ever made or whatever. And so it's not something like you wouldn't want to be responsible for blowing that up and how much it would cost to repair from a company that's out of business and you can't get parts for. So it's you wouldn't take those risks in the real analog world. But in the digital world, you can start to do things that sort of stretch and allow you to use things in different ways than they were ever used. People slam things a whole lot more in the digital realm than they did in the analog days for exactly that reason, you know? So there's an important, an important lesson here, and I think it's something where when I look at something, I judge the feel of it. Does this have the look and feel? Does it have the same sort of responsiveness that I remember from the analog world? And, you know, what is the general perception of the sound? Is it giving me something that I like when I listen to it? And then it's like, okay, well, is it exactly the same as that experience? Well, it's hard for me to just sort of extract the two in the same way it's, you, you can't sort of equate the, in my analogy, you know, the experience of being off road with your four wheel drive versus being the highway with your four wheel drive, same exact car but it feels different because the terrain that you're operating in is different, right? So important to understand. But is it a valuable and useful tool, right? And that's 
the most important thing. And that's why I wanted to kind of put this, I don't know if rant is the right word, so that it makes it sound like, you know, negative or something, or like, you know, I'm, you know, trying to tell people to stop writing down, it just doesn't sound like the real thing. Um, you know, that sort of annoys me a little bit, but not that much really. Uh, but now I have a link for a video uh, to send people to. So, and that was sort of the point of this. So uh, that's my plug-in rant of the week. I think it's my first one, but uh, uh, an only one so far. Maybe there will be more to come when other crazy things come up. But uh, there it is. Mix it with Mike. Plug-in rant of the week. Why plug-in emulations will never, ever, 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 ever be exactly like the real thing.